presented by Samuel Adams. Savor the flavor responsibly. Welcome to Highly Questionable. Dan is load managing or something like that. We got Dominique Foxworth. We got Mina Kimes, which means we actually have people on the show who know something about football. How big of a deal is it that the Bucks crushed Aaron Rodgers and his prematurely gyrating pelvis? Man, you want to talk about a game that turned on a dime. Those first 10 points the Packers put up look easy for them to get. Aaron Rodgers looked great. And in the next two drives, he gave the ball back to the Bucs. He basically threw two pick sixes. The first one, an actual pick six. The next one was run inside the five-yard line, and the Bucs scored right after that. But what happened next was the Buccaneers' defense just turned it on and dominated the Packers. And that's the part that I did not see coming. I don't think this is time to worry about the Packers necessarily, but if the Buccaneers are going to be able to play that level of defense, then they can get away with Tom Brady being old. Because in that game, Tom Brady didn't look bad but he still looked like old Tom Brady just figuring out a way to get it done. And if the Bucs have a defense, then he can be old Tom Brady and they can still win. Yeah, I'm not worried about the Packers, but if I'm another team in the NFL, I am very worried about the Bucs because they do have a defense and very few teams in the NFL actually have defenses this season, which is something I think we should have considered when we were hoisting Rodgers on a pedestal uh, up to this point, because so far he has played the Vikings, terrible, the Lions, terrible, the Falcons, what's worse than terrible, sorry, and, and the Saints, who I thought had a good defense, but really don't. So far this year, Rodgers has been the second least pressured quarterback in the NFL before this week. Brady was the least pressured. Yesterday, Brady's pressure rate actually went down. Rodgers' pressure rate went way, way up, and that is the difference. Look, he's still going to be good. The Packers' offense is still going to be good. They get to play Houston next week, which cures all illnesses. But the Bucks' defense, that is a problem for the rest of the league. Well, I don't know if I'm so confident that the Packers are going to be good or they, they are good in the first place because we watched them last year and we all saw them go through the season and dominate. And then they played the 49ers, which was a complete team, and they got crushed. And you just went through the team so far this year. It's not like they've gone through a murderer's row. And then you add to it that David Bakhtiari is, is hobbled now and he needs to protect Aaron Rodgers. That's going to be a problem. And you add to it that that defense, since they picked up all those free agents a couple of years ago, they still haven't really played all that well. They were buoyed last year by a bunch of turnovers, but they're not really playing sound defense. And on the other side, they're setting up Tom Brady to succeed. It's what you want to do with an older quarterback is not put a ton of pressure on him, ask him to make four or five big throws throughout the course of the game. If you isolate those four or five big throws, Tom Brady looked phenomenal yesterday. Then you look at the stat sheet and see that he threw for 160 and realize that he really didn't do very much. They didn't ask him to do very much, and that's the perfect recipe. And as for the first question, it's important to know if you prematurely have a pelvic gyration, all that means is you got to do it again later. <laughs> all right, now, let, let me ask this. For those of you who watch football a little bit more microscopically than me. Yeah, I mean, we're just going to act like that didn't happen. Look, oh, yeah, the, the one thing that got me about Aaron Rodgers on those picks, you tell me if I'm wrong here. He's one of the greatest athletes ever to play quarterback, which meant that he could get away with throwing some of those passes off angle and not necessarily being set. He looked like he had funny mechanics on those pick sixes and still tried to throw it, and it didn't go the way that it used to. Like, that's the one thing about getting old. If you're him, you're probably going to need to throw from a solid foundation a little bit more than he had in the past. Otherwise, it's going to be coming right back at you. And that's why pressure is everything and why it ended up being the difference in this game, because you're absolutely right. Like, if he's kept clean, he can get his footwork straight, he can make all the throws. All right, Dan's doing some low management. Like, it's the day of federal holiday that nobody even told me about. But anyway, he could not help himself because it was Aaron Rodgers. So here he is, you know, with something to say. All right, pardon the interruption. I'm sure that you guys are besmirching and blaspheming against my beloved Aaron Rodgers. I won't allow you to do it. I understand that that was probably the worst game of his career. I understand that seeing him throw a pick six is kind of like seeing an alien or Bigfoot land on the field. But how about that sensual celebration? Oh, I felt so good in my heart, everywhere in my body, in my soul, went up 10 nothing. He did something from Key and Peel in the end zone. This celebration right here, sensual as hell. Should we praise the Steelers or crush Baker and the Browns for their performance yesterday? 
Look, man, the Steelers won that game and the Browns lost it early. Once it was 10 to nothing, it was a wrap on that game. These are two teams that are on completely different tiers. And like Mina said about the Packers, what we learned about the Browns is they've been smacking up bad teams and getting smacked by good ones. That's where they are on this one. Now, part of this is the Steelers, right? Like, I think their defense is legitimately that good. I don't know the last time that they had a defense that was this good. But Baker ain't the dude, man. Like, he may wind up ultimately proving to be a decent quarterback. But tell me this. When you watch him play, do you ever see a number one overall pick? Like, when you look at that dude, if you had to point to the one thing and say, oh, yeah, I see why they took him number one overall. I can't find that thing to point to. Like, even as Jameis Winston had his struggles, you could see, like, oh, that's why somebody took him number one. Baker Mayfield, you know what he looks like? Wow, he was a short dude that was good at quarterback in college, and rarely does that ever work out. He ain't out here looking like Russell Wilson when he's pulled that off. He just looks like, insert name here, of guy who didn't actually make the NFL. Yeah, the thing that you point to for Baker when you talk about why he's the number one overall is his accuracy, and he's lost that. So he really has nothing else to lean on. In a league where most quarterbacks are athletic, his athleticism isn't even that much of a boon to their offense. So I think that it's a waste of time probably to talk too much about the Browns because the Steelers are really really good and I think they had the best defense against Lamar Jackson last year out of just about anyone that I saw without an offense they were contending in that one game that they played when Lamar Jackson was playing I am nervous for the Ravens in that division I think right now the Steelers are a better team they're better defensively more well-rounded I would say at least because they have actual pass rushers well whereas the Ravens they both blitz a lot, but the Ravens don't really create pressure without blitzing. The Steelers can do it both ways. And then you put on top of it that Ben is starting to get more comfortable throwing the ball downfield. And then you got this guy, Claypool, that it seems like you can give him the ball on sweeps. You can hand it to him out the backfield. You can throw it up, give him a slant. It don't matter. He's a top of the league type receiver. So the Steelers are coming fast. I agree with you, Dominique, that we should probably talk about the Steelers because they're the real contenders. But I dispute the notion that we shouldn't talk about the Browns because it is fun to roast teams. Um, you know, I agree with everything Bamani said about Baker. And I think what's concerning for Cleveland fans is like you're starting to get a clear picture of who he is, right? Like he's not the dude in 2018, the rookie who lit up the NFL. I don't think he's the guy who's as bad as he seemed last year. He's kind of something in between. Like if the offense is clicking, if the run game is working, if play action is working, if those rollouts are working, he's good. Like a lot of quarterbacks are in those Shanahan derived systems. But if you force him to drop back and, you know, just become a traditional passer, or if he's under pressure, he falls apart. Uh, and look, a quarterback like that can go the distance we saw one do it last year all the way to the Super Bowl, but everything around him has to be really, really good for that to work. You just to basically clear, called him Kirk Cousins. Yeah, yeah, you oh, called sorry. him Kirk Cousins. Like, that's basically it. He's Kirk Cousins. Like, that's what it takes. Everything else has to be right, and then maybe Kirk Cousins or the Baker Mayfields of the world can get it right. You know what I thought was actually the most damning indictment is we had, we thought, an Odell Beckham moment at first, right? Odell Beckham on the sidelines talking to his teammates, except that was Odell Beckham doing what quarterbacks normally do. It was Baker Mayfield to the side while Odell Beckham tried to rally the troops because, honestly, Baker Mayfield isn't good enough to do that rallying. All of that's to say a dude who wound up at the end of the game taking off his shoes like a five-year-old is the guy that this team has to trust to rally things when they're down because their quarterback can't do it. So, again, I ask you, what is this dude good at? Highly Questionable is presented by Samuel Adams from Boston. Did Romeo Cornell blow it by going for two against the Titans? All right, guys, the Texans, they are not good. They already ruined their season by even letting Bill O'Brien come back to coach the team in the first place. They got him out of there after it was too late to realistically think about making the playoffs. And so the Texans, overachieving, over their head against the Titans, up seven, late in the game, go for one and make the Titans get a touchdown and a two-point conversion, or go for two and end the game right then and there. Romeo Cornell, the last man you would expect to do this, decided to go for two. They did not get the two. The Titans came back, scored, kicked the extra point, and then won in overtime. And I look at the Texans and I say, what the hell did you have to lose? And the answer is nothing. We had a chance to put this game away and our defense stinks. Why not? We might as well go for it. It did not work, but who you got more faith in? That defense or Deshaun Watson? They leaned on Deshaun Watson. I'm okay with that. 
Thank you, Bomani, for accurately describing what happened. Instead of doing what so many announcers do every week, which is whenever a coach makes an aggressive decision like Romeo Cornell did, they blame analytics, right? It's become this weird cudgel for people to criticize these decisions when they often have nothing to do with analytics. In fact, in this particular case, ESPN's model actually favored kicking just by like the slightest percent. Look, as you said, Romeo Cornell didn't make this decision because of the analytics. He made it because his defense is trash and he wanted to win the game. And for that reason, I liked the decision. I liked the fact that, you know, he had big cojones, which is now something I regret saying about a 73 year old man. Well, I mean, two point conversions are about a 50 50 proposition. And I think that Bomani nailed it right off the top. Would you rather give that proposition to Deshaun Watson that may skew on the positive side, maybe get you up to 52 or 53? Or would you le- rather leave that decision up to Derrick Henry and your defense? Like, it seems to me that right there, that's the time. You think you believe that your guy can gain three yards is more likely that you get down and stop them from gaining three yards should they uh, score a touchdown at some point. So I think the decision makes perfect sense. It seems logical to me. I would understand if he would have just kicked it, but I don't think that's why they lost the game. I think that Bomani nailed it right off the top. You're the Texans. What are we doing? You're playing for ties? What are you doing out here? You're trying to win the game. Romeo Cornell trying to keep this job or something. Who knows? But you gain nothing by playing conservative in that, in that situation. I'd also like to take a brief moment here and understand that last week was not the time to give the Titans any credit for overcoming adversity because a lot of that seemed to be self-inflicted. However, I did not think it was possible that an NFL team could play a game on a Tuesday and then win on Sunday when the team that they were playing against played the previous Sunday. That was pretty damn impressive, including Derrick Henry putting up 200 yards under those circumstances. A lot of people talk about football and say, well, one team is playing checkers and other team is playing chess. And like the insult is that if you're playing checkers, that's a problem. But if you got the only king on the field, checkers is pretty damn okay. And it seems like that's what the Titans are playing. They are handing that thing off to their King Henry and he is bowling through people. Then they play action off of that. I do have to give Arthur Smith some some credit in the red zone. They've been pretty creative to find ways to make it easy for Tannehill to make to complete passes. And I've been critical of Tannehill because I think sometimes we overplay how impactful he has been, but he's truly been phenomenal the last couple of weeks in these games. So if Derrick Henry is the king, what does that make Josh Norman? Like the pawn that gets knocked over and the way to, yeah. (laughs) Will you all have to reevaluate your not-so-beloved Josh Allen if he beats Patrick Mahomes tonight? Why are you acting like he's the only guy on the team? Why do we only do this with this one guy? I have never seen a greater investment in one guy being good than they are for the people with Josh Allen, who, by the way, is coming off looking like cheeks the last time that we saw them play. Now, if the Bills happen to win this game, then we will have to look at the Bills as one of the best teams in the AFC. If Josh Allen plays well in the course of this, we will give him credit for the fact that he has played well but what we saw last week was teams realizing maybe we just need to zone up and keep our eyes on Josh Allen and just wait until he does something that makes absolutely no sense and then we'll have a chance because that's probably the best way to do it and I bet you're gonna see a lot of that in this game today so by that logic then Derek Carr is currently the best quarterback in the NFL and we need to reevaluate the way we look at things like no I'm not going to change my opinion of Josh Allen based on one game just like I'm not going to say that he's trash based on the fact that the last time they played he wasn't very good and turned the ball over and had some turnover worthy plays that that were not caught or picked up so I'm not going to change on a whim my analysis of Josh Allen was pretty accurate up until the first four games of this season First four games of the season, he was a different quarterback. If he can sustain that throughout the course of the season, we'll talk after week 18. You and I can sit down and we can discuss his current status. But at no point does anyone need to apologize or reconsider how they feel about Josh Allen because he hasn't really done anything to change the way we should look at him. I'm actually more intrigued by the Bills' defense in this game than Josh Allen because (laughs) while Josh Allen was – Cheeks, I think that's the word you used. Yes, yes. Uh, last oh, week, the, the Bills defense is like the real problem on this team, right? Because they've been, what's worse than Cheeks? Big Cheeks? I, I don't know. This show's getting weird. Anyways, the Bills defense worse. has been booty. I think that's it. There we booty. go. I like it. Yes. 
And uh, Bomani, like you talked about how defenses or the Titans defense in particular played Josh Allen very smartly. Defenses have been doing that to Patrick Mahomes as well this year. Like I wouldn't call it a formula, but you are seeing a trend. Uh, you saw with the Chargers, Patriots, and Raiders where defenses are playing more zone. They're not blitzing him. And I'll be very curious to see if the Bills defense, which blitzes a lot, is going to take a similar approach. If they do that and have success, I will be impressed by the Bills. Yeah, let me tell you what's funny, though. Last year, there was a stretch where we were wondering about Patrick Mahomes falling off a little bit. And you know what had happened? Teams decided they were going to play man against him. That worked for a little while, and then all of a sudden, it did not work. Something tells me that these folks going to solve the flavor responsibly. Part of happy hour. Do you question what was the more memorable part of the Dodgers comeback? Mookie's catches or Cody's homer? All right, I would just like to start by saying who to me for saying no to narcotics. Stayed off that Braves narcotic. That allowed me to not really be so worried about that 3-1 loss that they had. I was going to jump off for the World Series, but the World Series ain't going to be here. Now, let's look at Mookie Betts. Looks like some impressive catches. Forget how good athletes some baseball players are. They oh, there those... you go. Great I mean, catch. Yeah, that is phenomenal, and I forget. Great the game so slow. Let's get another one. Let's get another one. That's from Freddie Freeman, who don't look nothing like no Freddie Freeman that I've ever met. <laughs> Great catch. Great catch. Uh, give, him, give him some credit, Dominique. Oh, no, it's phenomenal catch. Like, these guys are great athletes, but they have on them stupid uniforms that make them look slow, and then they play that game that only allows them to do phenomenal things once every few weeks. It's a frustrating game, but they're hiding some phenomenal athletes back there. But still, I enjoy the swag of Cody Bellinger. Like, I'm, I'm yeah, always you here just, for, you, just, for you, you, you just hate the fact that baseball has no place for you to be if all you are is fast. Now, let's check out Cody <laughs> Bellinger. Yeah. You can run backward fast too. I guess that matters. Good God. Come That's on. Flat. You got to love that, Dominique. Did you I see that? It. You saw love that? It. The strut. That swag. Look there you that. go. Oh, man. That's, that's way more disrespectful than a bat flip, right? I'm not off base. The admiration, the strut, like that, if you if you just got hit off of, that's much worse than a dude flipping his bat around in the bases. Do them both. And the only criticism of Bellinger I have is why ever run? Walk that whole <laughs> thing. Keep that, that tempo the whole time. Enjoy it. Bass. There's no I shot clock. I'm not going to lie, man. If you just walked around the bases, <laughs> we got to scrap it out by the time you get to third. Like, the thing I think that gets yeah, lost about yeah. the baseball unwritten rules is that no other sport has anything like being a pitcher after having given up a home run and you just standing out there all by your damn self. That has to burn. I do feel like there has to be a certain measure of respect for the game on that one. Yeah, if somebody actually did what Dominique advocated and walked the entire way, I would go full goose gossage. I'd be like, you know what? Hit him. Hit him the next time around. The other rules were actually right. You know, like I'm actually a traditionalist. Tonight at 8.15 p.m. on ESPN, Monday night, football Cardinals and Cowboys. All right, look, I am intrigued, and I know that nobody likes to hear about anybody else's fantasy team. I totally get that. I think it's fair. I'm going into tonight's matchup down by about 60 points. I got Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins, which is to say, oh, baby, I got a chance. Playing against the Cowboys, I have a chance. All of us have a chance. You might even have nobody playing against the Cowboys, and you got a chance. Dominique, put your hand up. You intrigued? Uh... I have a 40 point lead and I'm going up against Hopkins and Drake. So I'm rooting heavily against that Cardinals team and hopefully the Cowboys can put together some sort of defensive effort. But I'm really excited to see what Andy Dalton does, mainly because Ryan Clark last week on Get Up called that man turkey bacon. And it was the funniest thing I heard all week because he is not as good as the real thing. He ain't really bacon. He just turkey bacon. So I just want to see what, what Dalton does if he shoves it in Ryan Clark's face or if we can call him turkey bacon on Tuesday morning. You're going to lose in fantasy, by the way. Mina, are you intrigued? I know. I know. I am intrigued, um, despite the fact that, as I told you guys earlier, I have Derrick Henry on my fantasy team, and I already <laughs> won. But I'll still watch because I love offense, and there's going to be a ton of offense in this game. I ran up all Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, and Derrick Henry in the same damn week, and it's this week. 
<laughs> you still got I'm a Matt chance? I'm Julio on my team too, by the way. I'd and let me tell you, let me tell you, it has been tough. It has been a tough road yeah. until this week. <laughs> All right, that is all the time that we have. Mina looked like she smelled something just a second ago right before this thing ended, so let's get her out of here before she winds up.